So talk a little bit about this. You've been helped a lot by neuroscientists and, and some philosophers Good. in kind of re-understanding the role of imagination, even in kind of um, anchoring in us a worldview. We tend to think of the worldview as a more analytical yeah. kind of practice, but you say, no, the imagination is really kind of at the core of a worldview. Talk about how we need to understand the imagination. Yeah, and it's, it's tough because I, I'm sort of using the imagination as a word to name I, I think maybe what other people would just call our intuitions about the world, right? But it's this, in other words, to imagine your world is to make sense of it pre-analytically. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a way of getting at it. You talk about also pre-consciously. And, and also pre-consciously. talk about it as a would kind it of fair? unconscious. It is a kind of unconscious, right. We say, what I know by heart. Yeah, exactly. And yet it's not a hardwired thing, right? So we're not just, it, there's a biological platform on which this operates. <sighs> And yet, what we're talking about are habitual ways of learning how to perceive the world that often we don't articulate, uh, and yet kind of govern our feel for the world. It's more like a know-how, right? Mm. And um, it just strikes me that a lot of recent research in neuroscience, cognitive science, even social psychology, I think kind of confirms a lot of ancient Christian intuitions about spiritual formation, which is this is a sort of know-how that you carry in your gut, that you learn, it's caught more than it's taught. Mm -hmm. um, and yet that doesn't mean that it's not intentional, um, you know, um, aimed at the world. It's, it's even its own kind of understanding, mm -hmm. um, but it, it builds on operations, I would say. I, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm always intimidated to, 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 to tread on your terrain here, but Go for it, it. it seems like uh, um, it's working on a register between body and mind. That's a, mm -hmm. a French philosopher that I draw on a lot, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, makes a lot out of this sense of the between. Mm -hmm. there, it's, the imagination is between intellect and instinct. Right, it's this sort of know-how that um, is built up over time, uh, and sometimes you have to unlearn mm -hmm. things that you've acquired in your imagination. You have to learn how to reimagine mm -hmm. who you are, what you are. And I think the reason why story is so important is, in some ways, Christian formation is the re-narration of our identity in Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like all of us carry a story yeah, in yeah, our yeah. bones, and, and some of us actually have, have absorbed a story that's not true, yeah. yes, that's right? right? We've, we've absorbed a false story. And these are the secular liturgies uh, that maybe you talk about. Yeah, and I mean, and, and, and the scary happen, thing is too, is it, it can, can happen, happen for church. Christians, yeah. right? I mean, you can be raised in the church and, and come from a really dysfunctional family context or really kind of toxic Absolutely. Christian context. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out that you've absorbed a story that is other than the gospel story. That's yeah. right. And so then what has to happen is, it, yes, you might intellectually grasp the, the, the good news of the gospel, but it might take a, an entire season of your life, it might take a lifetime right. to relearn at that imagination level that the Father loves you. Yeah. So we, all of us, I honestly think this is what scripture is going to, when it talks about then we'll, now we see through a glass darkly, then we'll know as we're known. You know, it's that when we see him face to face, then we're going to go, oh, that's, that's you. Oh, that's me. Because mm -hmm. we'll see ourselves mm -hmm. mirrored in his eyes, and it'll be the real us that he's been loving all along, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's beautiful. Psalm 8611 talks about, unite my heart that I may praise your name. So we're all living, to some extent, with a divided heart. Mm. Yes. We're all living under a false identity. Yeah. Now, to the extent that our parents were good enough parents, as Winnicott would say, and he, and so to the extent yeah. that our parents could care for the little people we were and tolerate our emotions and explain the world to us and train us, then when we come and hear the good news of the gospel, it's going to be good news. Yes. But I honestly know somebody who loves the Lord dearly and uh, came to me for spiritual direction, which is different than therapy. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about our prayer life. And so I uh, ask her, you know, when you talk to God about this, you know, how do you sense he's receiving you? And she said, oh, I would, I would never bring this up to God. 
why would I want to call his attention to me? I'm just hoping when I die, he'll, he'll let me in. Mm -hmm. And so there we see how her, exactly what you're talking about, this early, the, the wrong message, the lie that she was given of, you know, your job is to be quiet and sit in the corner, yeah. and if you're lucky, we'll feed you. Yeah. And so then when she hears about God, yeah. she loves him. Yes. But she doesn't yeah. know him, and she certainly doesn't yeah. know the evil. And it's Christ. almost like there can be a gap between your intellectual grasp of the gospel, which is absolutely crucial, and your sort of existential absorption of the reality of that good news. It's right? Your God concept versus your God image. Okay. Yeah.